So that's the talk on DFN, what to do with DFN. So this is, uh, okay, some thinking, some thoughts about uh, the, the DFN as a way of modeling natural factual systems. So how we do that, what are the issues, and so on. So all these ideas that I will derive are, uh, are driven by discussion with colleagues uh, from SKB uh, and from also from CNRS and from one company, Itasca, uh, with whom um, I have created a joint laboratory. So, so the name of the joint labor laboratory is the Crack Factory. So this is an intellectual production of the Crack Factory. For non-intellectual production, you see uh, people from the Crack Factories. <laughs> okay, so what we do with DFN? So we were at a meeting uh, two weeks ago, and most of the people do that. I have a problem. I have a factual system, okay? I have some data, three factor parameters. So this is a sort of quantification of the system. Then I create a DFN. DFN means discrete factual network. I put equation. I shake everything. <laughs> okay. <coughs> and I get the answer. So then I have that data to check the answer. And maybe it's different. Okay. It looks like you yesterday night. <laughs> So I'm right by doing that, or am I wrong? OK. So let's take some more serious examples that Yanolov developed a bit before. OK. Safety assessment for deep nuclear waste. This is a very tricky problem, but very important for the future. So Yanolov explained exactly the, uh, what we will have to do with the geological barrier. OK. And uh, the point, I don't remember if you say that, but uh, the point is SKB is doing very well because they are thinking fractal system, really. And what we have with them is certainly the largest database on fractures that we can have in the world. So if you want to think about fracture, go in Sweden, okay? But anyway, even, even if they are doing very well, you have very little information about the real case. Okay, <laughs> little data and what we know that before, first we know that we have only information where we see the things, so in boreholes, in tunnel, and so on. But if you compare the density of uh, the type of data here, you have one outcrop, one borehole, and nothing in between. So it means that you have little data, actually, to do that. So if you have no data, you have models, OK? And we use models to uh, replace the information that we haven't, OK? So you have the information there. I don't know how it works, this thing, like that. So you have the information, and you have the DFN, discrete fracture network models. And then you made prediction. So first prediction is connected cluster. You put the DFN and you know if there is a pass between two paths, three paths, many paths in between this system. Okay. Or you can calculate the permeability. Here you have the permeability. You put it as a fact function of something that you can measure. Here it's a fracture density. Okay. You have models. <laughs> Here you have exactly the same amount of fracture in both models and the prediction, but they are organized differently. And you see that the prediction between the blue curve and the red curve is different. So for high density, it's about similar. But if you look at this point, you have one order of magnitude differences between both <coughs> models. Both models have exactly the same amount of fracture. You can calculate, as Caroline explained, the elastic property. So again, as a function of fracture density parameter. But if you compare to previous calculation, actually, it's not the same fracture density parameter. So you have to find the right parameters that can explain the data. OK, so this is the job that we are doing for, with modeling. OK, and then 
we go to some safety assessment uh, framework. So you start from the data, you put different models, and for each model with the fracture models, you put models for transmissivity, models for fracture aperture, models for Compton coefficient, as explained before, whatever. And then you have one result. Okay? So this is similar to the talk of Jeff Kers, you remember, you have the models, prior information, data, prediction. The only thing, the only difference is that we, so this is a, just a question of dimension. So in Jeff Kers, you have a two dimension system, one parameter range, another parameter range. You remember this graph? Blue dots everywhere, which represents the possibility. And the earth is the red dot in between. But maybe the red dot is something is here. Okay, so we don't know. The complexity of the Earth is so important that we are not sure that it belongs to the, to the models, to the, the envelope of all model possibilities. So, so, so the scenario is just to think different type of modeling. So I don't know if uh, yesterday you you say that, but Dianolov has a word for that, you say alternative models. So you think differently. And if you think differently, you get different results. Okay? And this is important for the risk assessment scenario. I think Bayesian thing is very good if you do understand everything. If you don't, maybe the scenario process is better. <coughs> okay, so how you do with DFN? So DFN, you have first data. Geological mapping, geophysics, hydrologging, deformation, seismicity. All of you, you know the type of data, and you are working, most of you, on one new data that will save the world. <laughs> then you have two things. You have the core of the DFN, which is a conceptual model. So this is a statistical distribution. Why is statistics? Simply because you have no data everywhere. So deterministic means that you know everything everywhere. Statistic is that you learn something from one place and you try to extrapolate to another place. So we will discuss a bit. You have statistical domains. So you mean um, my statistic is valid in this domain, not in this one, etc. You have deterministic conditioning. You have test everything. You have also prior knowledge. We will see how we can input some prior knowledge in this problem. And then you build up a medium model, <coughs> like in any physics. So it can be stochastic model conditioned by data statistics. It can be discrete model. It can be continuum models. Okay? And then you make prediction for some application. And of course, the application uh, the, the quality of the prediction depends on the application and on the hypothesis that you make. Sometimes you need to add more, some parameters that are important for some things. Okay. <coughs> so, DFN. For DFN, you, you describe the, the medium as a population of discrete fracture. It's like to say, this school, we have a population of people. Okay? with different sizes and so on. So, this is easy to manage after in terms of modeling. So this is close to the target system. And this is important because when you will get data, you will put it in the model. And if you have to transform the data to calculate things complicated, uh, you can make errors in this transformation process. So with DFN, you are very close to the natural system, but only close, okay? Then, but basically it's a statistical model. This is important because you have no data everywhere. And it's a tool also, and this is a tool for prediction. So this is a way, the arrow where you go from data to prediction. But you have something more. This is also the tools to find critical parameters that are required to improve prediction. So this is also a tool to make this arrow. I want prediction which <coughs> data I need for this prediction. And you do it by modeling the system. 
Okay, data integration. What we do, we start from fracture rock. Okay, so you see this picture, you can see the same. Have you seen the, the fracture on the coast? It's incredible. You have different density of fractures. In some places, it's low density. In other places, you know, you have fracture with a spacing of, uh, I would say, two centimeters. So this is, you, you can see the diversity of uh, fractures that we can have. So fracture is roughly planar discontinuities that can be cracked, joints, fault everywhere. So this is controlled by in situ field. And more than that, if you put a geologist, a physicist, or a mining engineer in the field, you will obtain three different types of information. Okay, but we cannot deal with that. We deal with that. Fracture object. So this is idealized, of course, with respect to the geology. And this is a fracture object. It's a 2D planar object that we will put in models, geometrically defined by its position, size, orientation, shape. And uh, you have also uh, other parameters, process-based, like transmissivity, stiffness, whatever, that are important to calculate transport mechanical properties. And then you go from one object to the population, and the population, the first quantification of the population is the density distribution. This is the amount of population you put in a room. 100 people in this room, okay, uh, and this is the basics of statistics. Behind that, you have more complex statistics with correlation between different parameters. Okay, so uh, the point here is that if you start from fractal rock, the only parameter you can measure, you can measure aperture, local aperture, but as a quantity, a global quantity, is a total surface. Because with fractured rock, you don't know where a fracture begins and where it ends, okay? With the idolized object, you, you, you start from this picture and you divide into a small segments in 2D or a small disk in 3D. So you choose a shape, but the definition uh, of the fracture depends so if you have a fracture map, for instance, if you look at your at very small scale, it's, you know, in, in the, on the coast, it, it's mostly joints that you measure. But if you take uh, a, a satellite image, for instance, and you take the map of California, so you will draw a line, and the line is the Sandra asphalt, and Sandra asphalt is, uh, I don't remember, more than 300 kilometers. And, of course, it's different as an object, as a small fracture that you pick up. So the definition depends on the size. And this is something that we, uh, we hardly consider, actually, in the, in the model. And what we guess is that it's consistent with, you, with uh, hydraulic and mechanical properties. So if you take a fracture, it means that you, it seems that the flow in the fracture is a connection Activity ensured by the fracture itself is, uh, is the connectivity is ensured, and you have hydraulic connectivity, you have mechanical connectivity due to this idealized fracture. Okay, fracture populations, there are different terms. You have one density terms, you have the size distribution, and we insist on this parameter. You have orientation, and you have other distributions that you can put in, transmissivity, aperture, stiffness, whatever, okay? So DFN as a, as a modeling uh, strategy is a balance between system complexity and the facility to integrate data and to provide a stochastic distribution as a population of objects, okay? The notion of fracture in DFN is fully related to the transformations that you will do between fracture surface and fracture object. Okay, and the challenge, we rely really on the prediction uh, that the prediction is correct. So we rely on the prediction of a schematic model constrained by real data. Okay. You have data from different uh, support and scale to do that. You have outcrop mapping, 
So you, what you measure is not fracture size, but trace size. You have borehole fracture intensity. So <laughs> along borehole, you, you can measure the number of fractures. This is why people say, I have three fracture per meter, which doesn't mean anything, because if your borehole is small or large, you will have not the same number. Okay. You have tunnel mapping, and a tunnel is either an outcrop, if you look at the walls of the tunnel, or consider to be a borehole, if you look at, at large lengths, okay? And then you have also geophysical data, and you can see poster here, like uh, Justine poster. Justine is sleeping somewhere here. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have all of this, and what you do, you try to build a 3D model, because nature is 3D, fundamentally 3D. So the model is, we will come back to the model, but to build a, a 3D model, what you do in 3D, you say that if I have an observation in 2D or, or in 1D, the observation is due to one integral, which is the probability to observe by the number of fractures in your system. Okay? So how you do this for outcrop? You start from a 3D information, n is the number of fractures of a given size, given orientation, and so on. And in 3D, and 2D is the same in 2D. Number of fractures with the given trace length, given orientation. And you have correlation between both. So if you have a model for the 3D pattern, you, you have a relationship between the 3D parameters and the 2D observation. So the relationship first is related to the angle. This is the classical Terzaghi correction. If you have an horizontal plane and you want to observe an horizontal fracture, it will be very, very hard, okay? It's much better if the fracture is perpendicular to your plane. This is what he say. Then you have a, a scale relationship in uh, the size here, I take a power law for the size distribution. So in 3D, in 2D, <coughs> the power law is related to the 3D power law. And the difference between both, big, it's a dimension. So you, you, you go from 2D to 3D, and the exponent, you just add one to the exponent of the, of the length distribution <coughs> to go from 2D to 3D. You can do the same with borehole information, okay? And you have exact an expression. Same thing for the orientation issue. And you have also same thing for the size distribution. The point here is that for 1D model, what we, you are uh, counting is the number of fractures that cross the model. So you have no scale information with, in boreholes, okay? But you have a scale. If you have no scale, you have no information. And the scale is the diameter of the borehole. And you see, th the diameter of the borehole is related to this. Okay? So you have to put a scale on the measurement. So then after you check the consistency, so for instance, here, one example. <coughs> here, I take this distribution model, I calculate the density term as a function of the dip for different outcrops. So you see you have more vertical fractures than horizontal ones. I do the same because you have the same measurement with borehole and outcrops. So I do the same and I will obtain this plot. Well, many information. First, uh, blue square. Blue square are shear zone. So the signature of shear zone is different from the signature you get on outcrops. Second, uh, up triangles, the red ones, these are uh, the part of the borehole which is between zero and 200 meter. Okay? This is totally consistent with what we observe for outcrops. Okay? Good thing. But below, between uh, 200 and, and below, because here you have a borehole of one kilometer long, then you see that this is consistent for vertical fracture, but not for horizontal ones. 
So you have many information when you try to assess the consistency between your data. Okay? Uh, then you can do this plot, which are the pole distribution. Okay? I don't care with that. <laughs> and you can plot also the density. Here you have the density of horizontal fracture versus the density of vertical fracture. Okay? And you see uh, each plot, each uh, dot here. So is it the density as a function of depth? And each dot is correspond to a certain fracture domain that we identified in the boreholes. So you see that you have a very large variability first. Second, if you take the average for vertical fracture, the black line, you have no depth dependency. In this case, it's in Sweden. But you have a high variability. But for horizontal fracturing, you see that you have a very high dependency at the top. You see the average. And the, it's an exponential decrease of the number of fractures. And the value behind the exponential is uh, here, 100 meters. But you see it decreases also at lower depth, but with a different range. OK? And what we, you can try to do with that, I will not do it now, but it's important too, is to say, you see the variability. Is it controlled by some lithological parameters that you can measure independently? Or is it natural? And we do the exercise, and if you have all points with the same colors belong to the same type of statistics. So variability belongs, is one important element of the statistics. Scaling issues. So here I have a plot, classical plot. Maybe Olivier will show it. No, not this, not this year, but the year before you, you do. <laughs> OK, this is scale, and this is the type of information you get. So even in the scale, uh, if, if you have a, a scale axis, even though you don't measure, uh, you have some blank windows. For instance, you have measures of the linear mount maps at uh, scales of one kilometer, measure of outcrops, measure of course, and you see that it's difficult to cover the whole range of observation scale. So we have to fill the gap between measure, okay? Very few data compared to the general complexity of the system. And so scaling low is a key argument to provide a sound prediction of your system. So how would we do that? So first, uh, let's introduce some scaling and density parameters. So for anything, you have two kinds of parameters. One is scaling, one is density. Scaling. Scaling, say, so first, you calculate the number of fracture for a given size. So the number of fracture between L and L plus a small increment. You divide by the increment. So this is really a density distribution. And you divide by the total volume of your system. The scaling parameter, it measures the ratio of fracture for different length scales. Okay? And you have this expression. You take the logarithm of the number for a given scale divided by the number for another scale and you divide by the logarithm of the two scales. Okay? If both scales are very close, then you end up to this expression. And this is a scale parameter. For instance, here you have the density distribution as a function of the trace length. This is for one outcrop. And the blue line is these scale parameters. And you see that the blue line is about constant. OK? And then you have a density parameter. Density is the other parameter which is helpful to finish a distribution. So, it's, uh, so if you have a density distribution like that in a log-log plot, the slope is a, is a scale parameter. And the position of the curve, you know, in altitude, I would say, is a density parameter. If you have a Powolo model, it means that the density and the scale parameter are independent of the size. This is the definition of the Powolo. Okay? So, let's start. Many, so, again, this is from Sweden. 
uh, we have fracture sizes and we have different outcrop maps. You see the density of fracture traces as a function of the fracture trace lines. And you see all the data. And the fit, here we have two kind of fit there. So we can plot the density term as a function of the scale exponent. Okay. You see that you have one group of fracture system that is here and one group that is here. I, I, actually, in this group, we have two points, not one, because you, you could say this is an outlier. But you will see the outlier is much better than the others. Okay, so what type of information? So remember, you need a scale. The scale is my watch, okay? And you see the difference between both groups. Higher density for this group, lower density for this group. So they are different both in terms of density and in terms of exponents. Now, you put it in a larger uh, graph and you add new information. You have linearman linear mapping that you have there. And you see that, look at that. Here I have the two distributions that I measure for outcrops. And one is very good in fitting the rest. And you know what? The one which is very good is this small point alone. OK? So if you are in the field, you measure everything here, then you predict a density of big fracture much too large. Much too large. OK? OK. So now, if you have scaling law, yeah? Sorry, can you go back to the picture? So how good is the black for the low fracture tracing? Is it OK? Uh, no, no, you are. The power law that you determine, the black uh, line? Yeah? It seems to be a little bit better for the small length. Uh, the black line is very good for the small length, for 90% for of, the, of the small outcrops, yeah. Okay. Ah, no, we will, we will propose uh, uh, interpretation of this uh, after that, uh, okay. So now, if you have a scaling law, you don't, ma you don't matter with scaling law. What you need is to know which scale matters, okay? So in general, the contribution of a fracture process can be written like that. The con total contribution is the integral of something related to a physical process and something related to the number of fractures that you have in your system, okay? Or number of elements in your population. You can write it like that. And you can write it in this way, which is exactly the same, except that in, instead of uh, having the DL, you take D logarithm of L and you put L uh, in front. And why we do that is, is because if you look at this quantity, this quantity gives you the contribution of each fracture size, okay? So, let's take, let's take a practical example of that. You take this thing and you observe in the log-log plot this time of, of, uh, of evolution. Okay? So it means that the contribution of this part will be much larger than the contribution of this part. So for this, for this process, theoretical process, you are fully dominated by the contribution of the big fracture. And so you are dominated, so this is like a political regime where you are dominated, but well, I'm not sure that uh, Queen Elizabeth has some power on, on everything, but uh, I take this example just to show what kind of political regime it corresponds. I, 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 I should have put a dictator here, but uh, she is more pretty, actually. <laughs> so the point for that, the prediction will depend on the capacity to detect the largest fracture. So this problem is a problem for geophysicists because they should image the largest 
elements in your systems. Let's take another example. This. So now the total contribution is largely dominated by these parts. Okay? So this is people who now have the power. Okay? So I would say dom democratic regime, uh, well, there are too many versions of democratic regime. I, I'm not sure that people have the power really, but let's say like that. So the smaller fracture controls the physical process. But the point, of course, is what is the smaller, the small size, which is now beginning a critical issue. So, and then you can have this, okay? And you are dominated by something in between, okay? It's like this thing, maybe intermediate body in the system, which dominate everything. So, the process is controlled by stru structure of intermediate size, and the point now is how to make relevant measurements, if you want to do that. So let's take one example. You start from the 2D model, you remember? And then we calculate the 3D model by some stereological rules, and we calculate the contribution of fracture to a physical process, okay? Let's start with surface control processes. So the, the P term is, uh, is proportional to L to the square. So this is for valid for permeability of dense network, for mechanical property of fractures controlled by surface friction. So you have many processes which are like that. You start from the 2D distribution. These are data. And then you switch to the, uh, this expression. So what you see is that you are totally dominated in terms of surface by the smaller fractures in your system. You are in this regime. For, for surface, the, the total surface of a fracture system is dominated by the smaller one. Okay, another example. Percolation parameter, Caroline explained what the percolation means in control connectivity. It controls also the permeability of network close to the percolation threshold, <coughs> and it controls, for instance, the mechanical properties of frictionless fracture. Now, the plot gives that. So you see it's different because the dominant part is all the sizes between some value, and the end. So you have a wide range of, of uh, sizes which will control this percolation parameter. So the, I don't know which regime to take. So I take the problems that we have in France with the ENA administration, where you have people, here you have Emmanuel Macron, and uh, he has a lot of friends, and all these friends are controlling. So maybe this is one, it's not a very good example, but it illustrates the fact that you have a wide range of scale that control, and it's from some scale to the largest one. If you take one example that Caroline shows, you take the contribution of fracture to deformation, for instance. So you say that the contribution of fracture is proportional to the surface of the fracture and to the displacement of the fracture. The displacement is the ratio between stress and something, and something is the friction at the surface. And the other term is the fact that the fracture is not infinite and the matrix surrounding the fracture resists also. So you have both resistances. One is by the surface, one is by the matrix. The resistance by the surface, let's say it's constant, and the resistance by the matrix depend on the size of the fracture. So at the end, you have this kind of expression for the total. We transform it, and we get it like that. So it means that the, the fracture which will control the contribution to deformation are in between. Here. So you are in this regime. So it means that the maximum of contribution is given by fracture 
of here it's about of uh, several meters, two, three, four meters. And when you do mechanical measurements, you take samples and you know what? The size of the samples is about 10 centimeters. So your measurements are absolutely not relevant for this problem. Okay. Physical rationale for scaling. It's good to have scaling, but we want to know if we are correct or not. Okay, so I just illustrate what we would expect with a size distribution by a certain model, a model of fracture population. Okay, so I consider that fractures are like you. There is a birth, nucleation, there is growth, and then you die. Sorry, guy. Okay. Nucleation. I put some nuclei somewhere with a nucleation rate, okay? And a certain population of nuclei, okay? Babies are 2 kilos, 3 kilos, 4 kilos, so on. Then you grow, okay? And the growth is controlled, we know that, by the stress intensity factor, which it itself is controlled by the size of the fracture. So this is why you can write this equation as an evolution of the size, with respect, such as the pole law, like that. And then you can deduce mathematically that if you have this expression, at the end, you have a stationary distribution. It's stationary in the sense that the distribution is constant, but of course, uh, if you take a picture <laughs> at one time, then, and at another time, then the small fracture will become larger. But the loss of a small fracture is compensated by... Uh, uh, no, the gain of small fracture becoming larger is compensated by the loss of fracture from large to very large, okay? And then you have a real stationary distribution for this simple law. And the point is that the exponent of A in the growth law is exactly the exponent you will get for the size distribution. How fracture die? The observation in most of the cases is that we have a large amount of T intersection. So a large number of fractures are stopping growing because they abut on another one. So what we can say? So you can see this observation, but you will do uh, uh, field studies uh, before going uh, to swim, and you will count the number, well, if you do that, you can count the number of fractures with T intersections rather than X intersections. So what does it mean? You are in a sort of mosaic network because you have fractures abutting others. So what can we say with mosaic? You can say one thing which is important. The distance from one object to another is related to the object size. Okay, so if you have a certain density of objects, the number divided by the total volume of your system, the average distance, right like that, the average distance is uh, the density to the powers, power minus 1 over d, where d is a space dimension. So for this mosaic is 2, and in 3D for the fracture system is 3. If you do that, you can predict that for this, the distribution should look like, less, like that. Okay? So this is not a power law distribution. Why? Because we have some hierarchical properties. So one problem is that the big fracture tends to cross the smaller one. Okay? It's very difficult for a car to stop a train, but uh, the reverse, uh, a train stops very easily uh, a car. Okay? So you have this uh, hierarchical information. Fracture energy depends on fracture size. And an intersection should likely stop the smaller fracture. So you have the same thing, size proportional to the average distance. But now, the average distance is the average distance of fracture bigger than you. OK? So it's a cumulative to the power 1 over d. And then you can predict that you end up to a self-similar distribution, which is now a pole. Okay, 
Let's take one example. So the self-similar distribution. Here you have two examples of self-similar distribution. And you know why? Because at 20 centimeters, you see the same that at 10 kilometers. These, these fractures have been uh, taken in, in uh, Africa, I think. So you see the pattern here is exactly the same as the pattern here, but you have totally different scales. OK? So, so this is uh, the, the game we are playing with to make. So we, we do nucleation, we do fracture growth, and then we stop when the conditions are correct. And what we obtain is this. So it's a sort of collision game, actually. And when you do that, you put many fractures at the beginning, and then they, be, they grow. And they grow, uh, you know that if they are not stopped, they grow to infinity in a finite uh, time if the exponent is larger than one. And what you observe is at a certain time, you have a big collision rate, a, a huge number of collisions, so you have a sort of traffic jam in your system. And then it's, it's very difficult to add more and more factors. Okay. OK, <laughs> let's look at the size distribution. OK, the size distribution now is like that. So we have the concentration of small fractures, the concentration of arrested fractures. Both give power law, but you have two different power law, actually. And you have what we call the growth regime and the RS regime there. And in between, you have a length scale. And the length scale is really a function of what you put the nucleation rate, for instance, the growth law in your system, and so on. OK. And uh, Etienne <laughs> is working on something more complicated, where we couple these uh, very simplest, simple ideas to the calculation of the stress field, and we calculate, really, the fractal growth in the system. And we obtain something a bit more complicated. OK. Prediction in application. OK, let's go back to the DFN. DFN is a conceptual framework so where we can have model statistical properties. Model statistical properties can be either bootstrap from data or, uh, or emerging properties of your model. You see the power law, the length distribution for the growth model is an emerging <coughs> property. It's not uh, bootstrap from data, but it fits the data, but it's not bootstrap. OK, you have some tuning parameters, of course, because you're trying to make prediction on the structure or on the transmissivity. Uh, but of course, you are limited uh, in reproducing the geological complexity. And what you expect is that the geological complexity is within the field of parameter that you are studying. So first, so I will switch this uh, thing, but with DFN you can predict connectivity. Caroline already showed this uh, example, and this is very good. With simple index, you predict the connectivity. As a measure to calibrate, you can use equivalent permeability, but who cares with equivalent permeability? So if you have a measure of 10 liter per, me per meter rather than 1 liter per meter, you switch the permeability by a factor of 10, and you obtain the same result. OK? I think more interesting is the flow structure. So if you look, look at the number of fractures, then you will see that some are flowing, and others are not flowing. So you have a structure for the fractures, and you have a structure also for the flow. OK, so if you use this expression, you see you have, this is the average of the flow. QF is the flow per fracture. And SF is the surface of the fracture. So you have an average of the flow per fracture, and you, the first moment to the square, and here you divide by the second moment. And you see that if you double QF, you have exactly the same structure. So it indicates the flow structure, but it's not dependent on the flow intensity. So it's measurable, it varies with scale, 
And it's a measure of the exchange surface between flow and rock. So for some geochemistry or geothermal application, it's, it's, it's a useful index. OK. So this channeling index, you see here, you have the number of fracture per meter. And here, you have some flow error eval, the transmissivity, transmissivity distribution. And so this is a measure between this and this, actually. So in modeling, if you put a plot between the flow channeling indicator, which is the equivalent of a surface per unit volume, you can uh, plot it as a function of the total surface of fracture per unit volume. And you see for these two models, same, con same value of transmissivity, same size, same orientation distribution, you have two uh, different rules. OK, so application force mark in Sweden, we have this size distribution model, OK? But we have a problem. And one problem is that 80% or 75% of the fracture, of the total surface of fracture, is clogged. So they are non-contributing. So this gives a, a complication in assessing the scaling properties. So what we do? So you remember, we have this scaling. So we start from this scaling for fracture. And now we have to scale the open fracture, and we have not so much information. So this is the place where to have, we have to be creative in order to find the best uh, system. So one model could be this. All the big fractures still remain open. Only the small ones are clogged. Okay. So instead of having this distribution to calculate the flow, we start with this one. Or you can do like that. If this is a log plot, you distribute the clogging, open clogging percentage uh, either identically for all size distribution, or you can do whatever you want. OK? So this is one example. So we have three different models. You see that the percolation parameter for the three models is, so this is the percolation map parameter for the total fracture system. And for the, this model, you have this. For this one, you have this. For this one, you have this. So if large fracture uh, still remain open, the percolation parameter is larger. But this is totally consistent with what we explained about the, the pertinent fracture size. OK? We have also uh, to scale the fracture transmissivity. So we know that fracture transmissivity varies in order of magnitude. It's likely depending on fracture size. This is one parameter that you have to put in your process scaling. And it's also likely dependent on other parameters, like normal stress. OK? Uh, C'est fini, presque? Almost one minute. One minute. <laughs> uh, it's finished. So you have the data there. And we calculate the permeability average as a function of the scale. And you have the data which looks like that. And you have the three models. And you see that the data, you, we have this first decrease, then increase for the first model. And you see for this model, for instance, we have a total decrease of the permeability with scale. So one model is totally unable to fit the scaling uh, value. And this is very good to discriminate between the different type of models. OK? And why? the reason why is that if you decrease, it means that you, the permeability decreases simply because the transmissivity remains constant. Uh, so it means that you have one main flow path. OK? And if it increases, is that because when you increase the size, the probability to encounter a very transmissive fracture will become important. So these are two properties that are important. This is a theoretical study we did in 2D, where you have the percolation threshold here. Below decrease of permeability, above you have an increase, which depends on the transmissivity size uh, distribution. Again, for channeling, the channeling indicator is very good 
in, in discriminating between the different models. So I have no time to go. So the end, okay, DFN basically a combination of statistic and deterministic object. It's a medium description. You can trust him or not, trust it or not. It's also a tool to find the critical parameters and scale that should be measured to improve prediction. Not all DFN models are equivalent, and there are issues uh, about scaling, prior knowledge, uh, etc. So what do you mean by correlation with the backbone? You mean the so I guess what I'm saying is that if you have certain fractures that are percolating or, or where there's a lot of flow in your original model before you have the clogging. Ah, you mean the clogging process. Exactly. The, yeah. This is part of uh, Diane uh, PhD. Uh, and the, the point is that clogging is clogging random. So even if it's random, how it distributed? or non-random. And one possibility is that fracture where is there any relationship between the fracture, the clogging process, the clogging rate, for instance, and the flow. If you have a, a direct correlation or inverse correlation, you will end up to two different systems. And this is very important because the size distribution of open fracture will be, I think, completely related to what you are saying. There is one thing that I'm always struggling to understand when I see the FN model. I really like your first slide, that most of the time that you see models is some, just kind of, some kind of mixture. And I like that the way that you well explain how you address what you observe in reality and how you put this in the model. But it's always something that I'm struggling. When you have your distribution, you always have different length for the fraction, up to kilometers. Yeah. But when I'm thinking about reality, like if I think of kilometers, for me it's not a fracture anymore, it's mostly a fault zone, which is possibly, maybe I'm wrong in this, maybe it's just, you know, I'm geophysicist, so it's my understanding of geology and engineering geology is a little bit less yeah. than probably most of the rest of the people in this room. But my understanding is that the photonics are much more complex structures. It's much as a why much wider than a fractured zone. It's not continuous. You may have if you mention San Andreas fault zone, this super huge long fault zone, one more than one thousand kilometers. You have regions where you may have pathways so that they behave as a fracture, but other regions that are completely clock where you don't have it. So it's one unique structure that if you have to do a model that includes the San Andreas, you have to use this 1,000 kilometers fault zone fracture. But why, why, why you're not considering that when, when you do all the distribution that the bigger fault zone may be affected by, for example, stress distribution? So yeah. <laughs> you do the same mistakes as many others. <laughs> so this is what I explain when I say that the transformation between natural fracture and DFN is something that we have to take into account. But the point is to think, if you think that the DFN is reality, then you make a, a big mistake, and the reason why you make a big mistake is what you are explaining. So if you take the big fracture, okay, so let's take DFN is a modeling tool. Why is useful? It's useful because we can make a quantitative analysis in terms of population. But then, and, and then, don't forget that we will take statistical law and reproduce this stochastically. So I agree that a big fracture at like Sandras will be the combination of many, many systems. Okay? But these systems are highly correlated because if you look at, for instance, the segments of the Sandras fork, they are all aligned, okay? So if you want to reproduce segments that are aligned, it's very tricky in terms of modeling tool, okay? But if you take it, okay, it's very complex, but anyway, maybe you can 
uh, uh, try to have a transmissivity values for this fault. You can try to have a stiffness value for this fault. You can try to make some parameters. These parameters are obviously upscale. They are, cannot be directly measured measure on a small part of the, of the big fault. But you can do the job. You can do the job and then you have a method to treat the total system as a population. And I have another thing to say to geophysicists. Most of the time, they are only thinking about the biggest systems, the biggest fractures. Okay? So it's correct if the biggest fracture control everything. But for problems like that problem you mentioned, for instance, the correlation between stress and flow, it's not the bigger fracture which plays a maximum of role, but certainly the surrounding background of small fracture around. It's not related to your question. This is a <laughs> and then I would argue that what your place is looking. If you're looking maybe at the deformation, small scale deformation, I think like with you. Yeah. But if you look at the seismicity and especially if you look at the seismic events that can harm the population, then you don't care about the small ones. Yeah, because the magnitude, because the magnitude is uh, to the power of three, and so if you, yeah, if you make the exercise for magnitude, you are in the system, you are in the queen, in the queen Elizabeth regime, you know, where you are dominated by the largest one. But the coupling between seasons, and if you look at, uh, well, for some, for some uh, earthquake dynamics, you need to couple fracture of different sizes. So, I worry for the total amount of power, but not for some other things. <laughs>